Good morning. Jay with Great Scott Audio Productions and Bitten by Books Book Bites. This week we're going to go with book two, I believe it was book two, in uh, the Connor Gray series by, by Mark Del Franco. It's a really, really neat series, kind of an anti-hero thing, um, a lot of good adventure, a lot of good action. Uh, it's a pretty nifty ride. We're going to go ahead and start with chapter one um, and see how we do. So here we are. No good phone calls come at 7 o'clock in the morning. Strike that. No good co phone calls come from Detective Leonard Murdoch come at 7 o'clock in the morning. Actually, strike that too. No good phone calls come from Detective Leonard Murdoch come at 7 o'clock in the morning unless you count the fact that it means I might have a paying job. Of course, it also means someone is dead too. But that's where the no good part comes in. That's how I make my living now, waiting for the phone to ring, hoping a crime has been committed. Ideally, one that Murdoch needs a little fey expertise on. Some people make the mistake of thinking I used to be a high-powered druid working the crime unit for the fey guild. The only used to be part is the, uh, is the working for the guild. I'm still Connor Gray, druid. Just because I've lost most of my abilities doesn't mean I'm not what I am. To be fey, to be a member of a species that can manipulate what is superstitiously called magic, is not just a job description. It's a state of being. And my current state of being was in the back seat of a cab wishing I had a cup of coffee. Murdoch had given me an address in the deep end of the weird. The weird is not the nicest neighborhood in Boston. It's certainly not the safest, but it's where the Fae live when they have nowhere else to go. There's a comfort in that, a community of sorts, that outsiders don't understand. Especially when so many people end up dead here. The cab pulled off Old Northern Avenue on a, onto a narrow lane that, can be, that ran between two burnt-out warehouses. A block away, the lane ended at a desolate field with a small group of people wandering about, which, given the early hour, could only be my destination. I paid the driver, got out, and shivered. It was cold. Too cold for early October, and much colder than when I got in the cab just a few blocks away. I looked up at the sky and sensed more than a faint white haze in the air that was by no means natural. The early morning sun cast a surreal light, bleaching colors like a faded photograph. At the curb, a police car with its blue lights flashing enhanced the effect with a silvery sheen. Across the field from where I stood, the officers' uniforms looked almost black in the medical examiner's coat, a stark white. I recognized Murdoch immediately by his long trench coat, even though it appeared pale beige instead of its normal camel color. The field looked ashen. I stepped across the remains of a sidewalk and walked toward them. It had rained like hell the night before, and while the field had been muddy, should have been muddy, it was now an uneven surface of frozen ruts. I made my way to the center of activity, a body and dark clothing lying on the ground. Murdoch didn't see me until I was standing next to him. Bit nippy, I said. He didn't startle. But he smiled slightly as he cupped his hands over his mouth and blew into them. That's part of why I called you. I nodded. As a human, Murdoch has no fey abilities. But he's worked in the weird long enough to know when something is, well, weird. He's good at what he does, and part of what makes him good is that he knows when to ask for help. It's a lesson I'm still learning. I bunched my own cold hands into the pockets of my leather jacket. It didn't occur to me when I'd left the apartment that I'd need gloves in early October. What do you have? He gestured at the obvious body. Tell me why I called you. I stepped away from him, then between another officer and the medical examiner. On first glance at the body, my chest tightened. Damn it, Murdoch, you should have warned me it was a kid. Late teens, we're guessing. I haven't checked for ID yet, he said. 
The cop standing next to me, next to me nodded without saying anything. When you're in law, with, when you were with law enforcement, you see a lot of things you'd rather not. Dead kids are the worst. The younger they are, <clears throat> excuse me, the younger they are, the worse it is. Even if this guy, this boy, turned out to be 18 or 19, he still had a hell of a lot of life to miss out on. And his parents, if he had them, were going to be heartbroken. Telling the parents is the second worst thing about it. I put that aside for now and took in the scene. Lying face up was a white male with dark brown hair, obviously young with a pained grimace locked on his face. His head angled up too sharply to one side, which probably meant a broken neck. His arms and legs splayed out haphazardly. One foot had an orange Nike sneaker, the other just a plain white sock. He wore two hooded black sweatshirts, generic looking jeans, and a bright yellow bandana on his head. The bandana was wrapped, wrapped so the knotted ends stuck out from his temples. And I guess I'd go with a gangbanger. So far, unremarkable. I swept my eyes up and down the body again. His clothes were frozen. That meant he was out in the rain long enough to get soaked before the air got cold enough to freeze him. And the mud around him. He was embedded in it. Suck a, sunk a good two or three inches into the ground. I scanned the periphery of the body and gazed outward in concentric circles as I turned. He ended up here before mud froze. There's no footprints, and no indication he was dragged. No sign of a struggle. Bingo, said Murdoch. Tossed or dropped. Now I saw why Murdoch called me. The kid was too far from the edge of the field to have landed on this spot on his own. Either someone with tremendous strength had tossed him in, or someone who could fly had dropped him. A ferry dropping him was an obvious possibility. I estimated the shortest distance to the street at 50 feet, well within the range of strength for a troll or even a dwarf. It could have also been an unseelie, one of the shunned fae that don't fit easily into any species category. We didn't see a lot of those in Boston, but it was too early to rule them out. I'd go for dropped, I said. There's no slippage in the mud. He looks like he came straight down. I suppose if he were flung from the right way from the street, he wouldn't slide, but dropped is the easier explanation. Murdoch nodded as though he had come to the same conclusion. Naturally, that leads to why. I shrugged. I don't know, Murdoch. Look at the gear he's wearing. I think you're looking at a gang fight. He tilted his head to the side as he continued to look at the body. No physical signs of struggle, no visible bruises. We might find something when he's stripped, but why would a fey bother with him? Fey gangs are out there too, Murdoch. The Xenos figure out how to hold their own against the fey ones. You know that, I said. And human ones have been known to hire freelancers for a little revenge. I'd check that angle. He didn't look convinced, but that's Murdoch's nature. He wouldn't be happy until he nailed, down, nailed it down precisely. I know he has more than a few files of unsolved cases that he uses for bedtime reading. He's the type. Thank you again for listening. Next week we're going to do kind of a special, to me it's going to be a special event. Uh, it's going to be a reading from Vicki Pedersen's first novel in the Signs of the Zodiac series it is Scent of Shadows. The series is so special to me, as are the people I've met on Vicki's Pro Boards and Vicki herself. And then the week after that we're going to visit with Lilith St. Crow again, and then we're going to do a super special Christmas one uh, from a book called Holidays or Hell, which is an anthology of Christmas paranormal series or stories, and we will go ahead and pick one of the stories. And I may read the whole thing if you guys can stomach a half hour to 45 minutes of me reading. I don't know. But we'll talk to Rachel. We'll see how we do. Have a good week, and we'll see you again.